It's the Old Time Baseball Show with your host, Jim Farmer, and co host, Rufus Guy. Well, welcome back to the Old Time Baseball Show, folks. This is our second show, and uh, I'm your host, Jim Farmer. I'm Rufus Guy. And we are going to be talking today about other Major League Baseball teams that were in Cincinnati during the 19th century era. Now, um, our show is based in Cincinnati, for all you uh, listeners out there nationally. We are kicking our show off with a lot of Cincinnati baseball history because, of course, that's that's where we're most familiar with. But we will be expanding to other teams because we, you know, it's not just about Cincinnati. But we are based in Cincinnati. I just wanted all of you listeners to know that, and you know, we'll get get to a lot of uh, fun topics, uh, you know, outside of outside of the Cincinnati area. But right now, we're we're going to focus the first few shows on Cincinnati sports, and this one is dedicated to. Uh, two Major League Baseball teams that competed against the Cincinnati Reds during the 19th century. Uh, the first one is the Cincinnati Unions. What do you know about the Cincinnati Unions, Bug? Very, very little. <laughs> I, I, I do know that they were called the, the, referred to as the Outlaw Reds. Yes. That's about, about it, really, coming into the, today's, you know, doing the right. research that I had to do for today. Yeah, we, we uh, the Outlaw Reds is a better name than the Unions, but... You know, um, th- and the this- unions because of the Union Association. Absolutely, yes. The, in, in 1884, uh, there, there were three major league. There were two major league major leagues um, in 1883: the American Association, which the Cincinnati Reds played in, and the National League. Uh, and a new uh, league was formed called the uh, Union Association. Okay, a third major league. They wanted to put a team in Cincinnati. And so that's what they did in 1884. So in 1884, folks, Cincinnati had two Major League Baseball teams, the Cincinnati Unions, or Outlaw Reds, and the Cincinnati Reds. I'm sure that wasn't confusing to anybody. (laughs) Well, it was so weird back then, if you think about this. um, they, They evicted the Reds from their ballpark. The Reds played at Bank Street Grounds from 1892 to 18. I'm sorry, 1882 to 1883. They only played there for two seasons. A lot of history was made in that ballpark too. It's really weird that, that it was such a short span. But we'll get into that a little later. But uh, the Reds built a new ballpark a few blocks south of Bank Street Grounds. So you had two major league teams, Rufus, uh, within a walking distance of each other. Now. You know, you didn't have media like we do today, and you didn't have team nicknames and whatnot. And the Cincinnati Unions pretended a lot to be the Cincinnati Reds to try to lure fans in, in, into the game. <laughs> so you, you mentioned it's confusing. Well, there you go right there. And being so close together in the ballpark just a few blocks away, it was so atypical of the other uh, cities in our country that had, that had sported two Major League Baseball teams and even three in some places like New York. It was They were in different boroughs. One was in the Bronx, one was right. in um, Manhattan, the other one in Brooklyn. In Chicago, it was uh, uh, the North and then the South. And, yeah. and it's such a wide expanse in between games. Cincinnati teams, these two clubs, going with pretty much the same name just a few blocks away, it's... Now, imagine, it's hard to fathom. Uh, imagine you, me, our producer Cam Miller, and our buddy Dennis Hasty, us, us four, are at a at a at, a, uh, at Bank Street grounds when when the Outlaw Reds are playing there. Um, of course, they changed the name to Union Park when 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 they booted the Reds out of there. But imagine us four. We're we're pretty pretty upset that the, the that this team isn't doing all all that well. And we all say, you know what, guys, let's get out of here. Let's go check. The Reds are playing down the street. Let's go walk down the street and buy another twenty five cent ticket and go check check the last few. You could you could have done that. I'm sure that, and I'm sure it had happened too. I mean, if you're in the game and they're they're getting blown out, you know, fifteen to nothing by the second inning, let's go down the road. <laughs> this is the heck with this. But it, it, it was it was kind of an interesting period because. Fans were regularly, Reds fans were regularly accosted by um, uh, Cincinnati Unions fans, you know, bullied to go into to Bank Street grounds instead of uh, American Park, which later became known as League Park. Where and the, this, Reds, and Reds the Cincinnati built. Unions team, they, they, they were really making it a point to become the established club in Absolutely. the city. Absolutely. So they were, they were making every effort possible to be the real Reds. The only Reds. And what did they do? They booted them out. One of the one of the owners um, 
one of the owners, let me think, Justice, Justice Thorner was a previous owner of the Cincinnati Reds, okay? And he went on to become uh, the owner of the, the unions, okay? And what, what did he do? He, boot, he, he, made, he booted the Reds out of the ballpark and think, thought that that, that that would really make it difficult for the Reds to, to field a team in 1884. But what they did, they built a ballpark two blocks um, uh, south on a spot, an old brickyard, a spot where League Park was built, and then Palace of the Fans, and then Crosley Field. So baseball was played at, when the Reds moved to a new, uh, and built a new ballpark. They, the location they picked, actually endured for for a long, long time. And really, that the unions didn't really have much of an effect uh, on the city outside of that. And I, that, that's a really cool thing to talk about. You know, to, to, it's just because they were so short lived. Well, they and they were initially going to be um, when the, when the league folded, the union association, the owner of the St. Louis Maroons, whose team won the pennant. Um, he he's the one who he created the league, and he, he more or less created a monster uh, because he. That he stacked the deck in favor of his team, the St. Louis Maroons. Okay, and the St. Louis Maroons went on to have the most, uh, the highest winning percentage of of any uh, Major League Baseball team to date. I think it's, it's up in the like point eight something something. I don't have the I don't have the information with me right here, but that team, when the association full uh, Union Association or the Onion League, as they called it sometimes, the Union. <laughs> yeah, when they, when. They they moved into the National League, and the uh, the 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 unions were going to move to the National League as well because those were the two strongest teams. The unions actually finished second in the Union Association um, uh, standings. The Union Association folds. Okay, one of the teams moves. The St. Louis Maroons moves to the National League, and then the the, the unions were going to move. And they were going to replace a team called the Detroit Wolverines because they were in shambles. But the Detroit Wolverines, of course, um, managed to, to, to stay afloat for a few more years. And there was nowhere for the, the Outlaw Reds or, or the unions to move to. So, yes, they were, they were, they were short-lived. But, um, you know, they were kind of a neat, neat, neat league if you look it up. Some, some baseball historians claim it wasn't a major league. But, you know... It, it, it is what it is. It's listed as a major league right now. Right. And as a historian, by saying it wasn't a major league, it was because of some of the inferior competition and right. some of the inferior talent. Absolutely. And uh, there were a few superstar ball players in there. And some of the historians believe just because their numbers were so much higher and better in that one single season is because they weren't playing against better talent. It, it's you know you had a lot of um, lot of like castoffs and whatnot sign up for the union association. I think you at that time you had more than thirty major league baseball teams. <laughs> you know when you add them up because a lot of the teams in the union association where they'd fold mid season or move. You know uh, for you hockey fans out there uh, that remember the old World Hockey Association stuff like that happened happened in that league as well. Teams would move move mid season and. Or, or fold, and that, that's what was going on in the Union Association. But they had, they had, they had some key players on the team. One in particular uh, was a guy named Dick Burns. The I pitcher. Know, yeah, pitcher. I don't know how you could live with a name like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he pitched the first no-hitter in Cincinnati uh, Major League Sports history. Okay, uh, the Reds didn't have a, their first no hitter was Bumpus Jones back in, in the early eighteen. I think I think it was eighteen ninety two in the final game of the season. Um, don't don't quote me on that. But Dick Burns was he pitched the first no hitter was on August sixteenth in, in in Kansas City, and but but you know I think that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? That that we had a no hitter out of out of out of, um, out of uh, off of a pitcher from from that. From that team, right. and Dick Burns, he was uh, an incredible pitcher, uh, a true lefty, batted left, threw left, and uh, he was also known to be a great hitter as well, wasn't he? Absolutely, he led the the Union Association in triples, and he led the Union Association in batting average, point uh, three oh six hits, doubles, and home runs with a whopping seven. Home runs were, were – were, you had a lot of in-the-park home runs back then more so than over-the-fence ones. So home runs weren't, weren't common. But, but you know, that, he, he, was in pretty, he was a pretty impressive player. 
Absolutely, and he, and, and he fits the mold. He was a more of a complete player, too. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of like of the mold that Babe Ruth later would have been made Absolutely. out of as, as a pitcher hitter. And even at the modern era, um, uh, Madison Bumgarner and Mike Leake and Brooks Kieschnick, you know, they were hitters and pitchers as well. Yeah. Well, you know, Bronson Arroyo hit uh, – well, he, he was a pretty good hitter, too. Um, but, yeah, yeah you, you're, you're – yeah, you're exactly right. Which, Who else do we have on that team? Uh, well, let's see, Jim, Jim McCormick. He was a stellar pitcher. He pitched for the the Cleveland Blues from 1879 to I think 1884. He was a Scottish player. He was the first Major League Baseball player that was born in Scotland to play here. Oh, is that, is that is that the case? Yeah. Okay. Well, he won 21 games for the Union for the Union Association, led the Union Associ- Association in um, in ERA and, and shutouts. So you know we had some pretty good pitchers on that on that club. Um, we also had a guy named Mox uh, McQuery, I think his name is, and he he was a Covington native, and he went on to um, become a, a cop after after his days in 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 baseball, and unfortunately he was killed in the line of duty in 1900. Um, but so. yeah, Big Mox was definitely an interesting character. Uh, he was a uh, very tall and slender uh, first baseman type of uh, a player. He had that he had the very quintessential look. In the 1800s, <laughs> he had that the handlebar mustache and the floppy oh, cap, yeah. and he he really really looked the part. Um, but like you said, he was he was from uh, Covington. Um, he was a, a local player, you yeah. know. They, as in Dick Burns and when McCormick came over, they were uh, and more inter, in more national players. Where he was more of a local guy, yep. and he stayed here after his career. Um, interesting about him that you said that he was uh, killed in the line of duty in 1900. Correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, a horse. There was a streetcar that there was two murder suspects on that he was in pursuit of and he had stopped the streetcar and he had uh, taken both of the assailants off of it yep. and, and in that process he was shot in the chest and, and it was mortally wounded he ended up dying three days later and interesting about him when you see his gravestone in the Linden Grove Cemetery in Covington it has a very large carving of a police department badge from the city of Covington and has an, an inscription where it says that he was he died in the line of duty in 1900 doesn't say anything about him being a baseball player and he was a great baseball player it, it wasn't, yeah. It, it, that wasn't. It's similar to Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> when you now, this is this is interesting. Thomas Jefferson. Um, there were three things that he was noted uh, that he 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 wanted to have remembered uh, on his gra- gravestone in, in in Monticello, and he left off his presidency. You know, the pre- his presidency wasn't wasn't as important to him as. As other things, and I, I think of, I think of that with Mox, with Mox because his baseball career wasn't. I, you know, we're just speculating here, but it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it didn't. It, it wasn't the thing that he wanted to be remembered by. Um, but yeah, we lost a man in blue there, and a, a, a local player uh, that you know um, did his part. Did his part in Cincinnati baseball history. So I think that's about it for the unions. Just one more thing on yeah. that. How did the fans react when they, the, the, the ballparks were so close? And it, and then these guys, it, 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 as good of a season that they had and were playing so well, um, they had challenged the other Reds team. Oh, yeah, teams. yeah. That's re- absolutely right. And, of course, they, they repeatedly challenged them in the press. They would constantly – there would be, like, advertisements or whatever uh, constantly – Saying, "Hey, let, let you know, let's see how good you guys are. Come, come against us." But, but, but the Cincinnati Reds, you know, they 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 shunned them. They, they continued they, to decline it. And uh, yeah. I think I think my personal reason was they didn't want to look bad. <laughs> exactly. Because if that if the, if the if the outlaw Reds beats the real Reds, right. our fans going to be influenced to, to establish this outlaw team, right. the Union's team, yeah. as the real Reds. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm sure they were faced with that as well. Yeah. Now imagine, imagine. If the Detroit Wolverines club didn't fold, we would have, the Outlaw Reds would have moved, or the Unions. So just, just for our listeners, if I say Union or Outlaw Reds, because they didn't the call team. themselves the Outlaw Reds. No, the, no, no. The, the media typically called them the Unions, but but if you look them up in, in you know on, on Wikipedia or whatever, it's going to say Outlaw Reds. I think it's a cool name too. <laughs> you know, and it fits them for the for that short time that they had. It was a. Uh... A very well given name. Well, well, you know the owner. This is a funny story. The owner said, "You know, we, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have taken their ballpark. We should have we should have raided their players, the Reds players. <laughs> you know, because they had Ben McPhee. They had so you know they they were coming off of you know two years prior when uh, the Reds won the pennant in eighteen eighty two. 
finishing up on the unions? Is there anything else you had a you wanted to bring up on the Cincinnati Unions team? Oh well, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love the audience to know that their their ballpark was located where Sorda is now. Are you familiar with at the, at the foot of Bank Street grounds? A little bit. The sort is the, the Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority. Yeah. And it's um, very, you know, if you can find Crosley Field today, there's still a yeah. marker for that. And it's it's on the hill yeah, pretty just, much just, behind it. Yeah, you, you, it's in walking distance. Right. And, yeah. And, and the interesting thing. You could hit it with a baseball. You, you, yeah, yeah, the Reds probably hit a home run right at, right in, into their center field or whatever. <laughs> but, but Bank Street grounds hosted three major league clubs. This, this, this. this Ballpark has had a lot of history in its short run. I think it only had a five-year run. Okay, legendary. You had the 1880, the the, the second incarnation of the Reds that, that lasted from 1876 to 1880. That club played its final season at Bank Street Grounds before it was dropped from the National League. Um, then the new Reds, which are our current modern Reds that were established in 1882, played there for two seasons and they won the pennant in that in, in that ballpark. You know, in 1882, the Reds won the won won the pennant. Um, I know the the Chicago White Stockings clinched the pennant in 1880 in Bank Street grounds. The White Stockings, of course, are now the Cubs. Um, and then you had uh, the Union U- Union Association move in there. So you had three different teams spanning three different leagues within a five year period in this ballpark. You know, I, 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 I'm incredibly fascinated with, it, with, with, with Bank Street Grounds, and I, I plan, plan to do some heavy research on it just for, for my own uh, curiosity and interest. Um, Is there the, anything left over from that ballpark today? N- no. No remnants whatsoever. I, I really wish that we could, we could get a monument put down there because it, it's, it's well worth it. The Reds' first championship was there. Um, you figured even the White Sockings would put something there because, I mean, it was a oh, significant moment for them. Well, yeah, they won the pennant. But um, it, for, for, for our listeners in the Cincinnati area, the, the, the sort of parking lot, you can just pull right in there and you're right on the field, you know. You just make, you go, make a left on a, from Bank Street, Bank Street in, into sort of parking lot, drive around. That um, parking lot is where that ballpark stood. And, and make, a few other... Um, a few other uh, structures of our landscape were in place at that time that still exist today, such as the, the railroad lines yeah. and the Mill Creek. Oh, God, yeah. 75, the Interstate 75 runs through there, too, but of course that didn't come until the 1960s. Right. But um, yeah. the landscape is it's still identical to the way it was then. And yeah. Nothing there has changed. And, and, and I don't know how much, how much space there is uh, between where Bank Street Grounds was and what League Park eventually became. You had four major league ballparks in, a, in that area. There's a lot of baseball history down there that, that that's overlooked. And, you know, the unions, unions you rarely hear about the unions uh, because why would you, <laughs> you know? But unless, unless you're really into the 19th century and Cincinnati sports and if you're from Cincinnati. But it's, I think it's an interesting little, uh, little thing. I think a lot, of, a lot of our people, the listeners that listen uh, nationally, should uh, look, look up their cities and see if there's other little, little asterisk-type teams such as the Cincinnati Unions because, you know, um, Boston had a team in the Union Association, you know, and, and all that other stuff. So it, it's, it's really cool. So. And how long did the Union Association itself last? It was just the one year? One season. Yeah, the, the, owner, the owner destroyed The owner who, of the St. Louis Maroons who established the team, the league, uh, just, just, just buried, buried. He, you know, I mean, nobody could compete with the St. Louis Maroons. They had, they were off to such a huge, immense start, and he, he, he stacked the deck for his own team, and you know, that, See how that worked for him. Yeah, the St. Louis Maroons moved, to the, moved into the National League, and then this is a little uh, connection here, a little, little interesting thing here. They moved to the National League, and of course, they finished. They were terrible in the National League. Um, they eventually moved to Indianapolis and became the Indianapolis Hoosiers. And the uh, owner of the Indianapolis Hoosiers was a guy named John T. Brush. John T. Brush went on to own the Cincinnati Reds in the 1890s. And then he went on to own the New York Giants in the 19 aughts. Okay? And uh, so that team, that, the Maroons, became the Hoosiers. And the owner, uh, owner of, the, of, of, the, of the Indianapolis Hoosiers went on to become owner of the Reds. And we had some good teams in the 1890s. That's a subject we'll, we'll tap in. There was some really, really neat stuff in the 1890s that we'll tap into. But, but we're moving on, and we're going to talk about the other team. Uh, this team is called the Cincinnati Kelly's Killers. All right? It's led by the infamous Mike King Kelly, baseball Hall of Famer. 
Um, this team was established in 1891 uh, to compete against the Reds. This was this was by far the most bizarre bizarre off season. Um, my producer and I did a did a did a video a, a documentary on on this team, <laughs> and we were just just it was just so hard for us to des- describe how this uh, how how this off season transpired and we wind up how we wound up with two teams. And if any if any of you are interested in, in viewing that video, it is on YouTube. Just just look up the Cincinnati's Kelly's Killers, and it should pop up. But um, it, it's about a twenty minute video, pretty neat. But uh, the, the killers were the 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 Reds. Here we are, here we are. I'm going to do my best, Rufus, to try to try to try to hash this out. The Cincinnati Reds left the American Association in 1889. They moved to the National League in 1890. The Players League. There was a new league called the Players League that was established in 1890. So you had three major leagues in the. In 1890, the Players League did did, did a lot of damage to, to all three leagues. They they just they just struggled and and and, and whatnot. Um, an owner bought the Reds during the 1891 off season, and they were he was going to move the club to the Players League. So the Reds had this happen. The Reds would have played in the American Association in 1889, the National League in 1890, and the Players League in 1891. I mean that's how crazy things were back then, you know. I mean, it's not like it is now. You can move a move a club at the drop of a drop of a hat. So and they he, did. Yeah, yeah, they did. And he he was committed to the players' league during the off season. Um, the Na- the National League was furious, so they 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 awarded a new expansion team to to Cincinnati. And who was the owner? John T. Brush. The guy I just mentioned that owned the Indianapolis Hoosier or Hoosiers, et cetera, et cetera. So John T. Brush was awarded this this expansion team in the National League, while the the the, 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 the our current Reds were going to be playing in the Players League. And then um, he up and sold the team. He up and sold the team out of nowhere because the players on the team, such as Bid McPhee and, and some of these other guys, they they weren't on board with this this shift to the Players League. So. It was just the, the the Reds were falling apart in the Players League. The Players League itself was falling apart and declared said that they were done. So then, the Reds owner said, "We're going to move the team to the back to the American Association," and the American Association was glad they had it. The, the Reds back after two after uh, a year a year off. Well, the owner decided to sell the team. And John T. Brush, who had this expansion team in the works in the National League, just bought the franchise and moved it back to the moved it back to the National League. So, so the Cincinnati Reds were committed to three different leagues during the 1891 off season. But you wouldn't know that if you look at the, look at look at the statistics because it doesn't look like they missed a beat. But this is what spawned the Kelly's Killers. The American Association was furious that John T. Brush uh, bought this team off of this this new um, owner who only owned it for about three or four months. They said, you know what? We're going to put a team in Cincinnati. You know what? We're, we don't care. We're going to put a team in Cincinnati. And that's the Kelly's Killers. That's how the Kelly's Killers popped up. Uh, now, I know that's a lot to follow, folks. And what was their real name when they started off? Because they weren't known as the Kelly's Killers then, No, of course. The, the media referred to them as the... Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> you talk about confusion. Well, the Reds didn't have a trademark on that name. No. So, I mean, that was a, the nickname, the Cincinnati Baseball Club, right. and it was a Reds nickname. So the media can do what they want with the nicknames. Yeah, well, yeah, they were called the Cincinnati Reds. All my newspaper clippings <laughs> referred to them as the Reds. But you know, all, you know, just kind of offbeat, they would refer to to the team as the Cincinnati Kelly's Hustlers, the Cincinnati Keller, Kelly's Braves, Cincinnati Kelly's Killers, and somewhere down the line, Kells Club, and, 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 Kells and, Club. and they didn't wear red. No, they they had red stockings. Okay. Actually, 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 they they're, they're, they were their uniforms were identical to the Cincinnati Reds, but for the first two two months, um, Kelly dressed as men in stockings and in, in, in green stockings, which was very rare at the time. Only one team had wore wore, wore green in their uniform, and Kelly, his Irish roots, um, he had 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 the team dressed in stockings, but the ownership said, nope, no, 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 where you're you're wearing red. It was basically a, a copycat club, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was owned by uh, um, 
Chris Vondere, who who guided the Cincinnati or not they guided the St. Louis Browns, who are now the Cardinals, to, to four straight American Association pennants. So, um, you know, it, it's I love this club because my family is from the East End, okay, and that's where they played. What I've learned about Vondere is, is, is incredible. <laughs> he's he's a very colorful character, and then also Mike. The King Kelly. I mean, oh, absolutely. He's become one of my favorite players from the 1800s just because of all the antics that he that he got away with and was known for. Right. And he was extremely famous. I mean, it, it songs written about him just by from the way he played. Oh yeah, slide Kelly, slide, and um, with the extremely thick Irish brogue all the way through it. Well, he, you know, I, I do believe he penned the first uh, baseball pl- autobiography. Um, the, of a ball player, and I think I think he he was, I think when autographs came, started becoming somewhat of an interest, I think he 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 signed a lot of autographs, but he did a lot of colorful things. I, I love one of the stories. Um, you know, my, I, he he used to frequent all, a lot of like beer gardens in in, in the East East End area, and my my great great grandfather owned owned East End Cafe during this time, and I, I just love to imagine maybe he walked in there and got drunk, but he got drunk one night, um, tossed down a lot of whiskey. And he decided to go for a swim in the Ohio River, right? You know, now, fa- folks, the ballpark was located where where the Schmidt Recreation Complex currently is. So, uh, local Cincinnati and the listeners, that's where the ballpark was, uh, East End Park. So, the clubhouse and whatnot. So that it was right by the river. So he he gets in the river, he starts swimming. He underestimated his his capability and nearly drowned. Nearly drowned in the Ohio River. We nearly lost Mike King Kelly in the Ohio River. That would have been a, that would have been a downer. <laughs> He'd have been a martyr in 1891. <laughs> well, he eventually did drink himself to death. But but he. Had, I mean, there's so many colorful things about him. Um, we mentioned a previous player from the Cincinnati Union's team, uh, McCormick. McCormick had ran a tavern in New Jersey, and it's believed right. that Kelly was a bartender for him at one time. Oh. And the neatest thing I heard about his bar, his tavern in uh, New Jersey, is that he had a live ticker. For the gamblers to keep track of the races and the uh, baseball and the horse races. I had no idea. That, that, that's pretty cool. The, 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 there are so many other key players yeah. in that team, too, that we could uh, talk yeah. about. We, we could probably talk hours just about Kelly himself. And right. Kelly, he was, he was a celebrity. If he took Absolutely. all of his baseball out of, out of his legacy and completely, t- and he was a celebrity all in itself outside of baseball. Well, he, did, he hit the vaudeville scene regularly. He was very popular in the vaudeville <laughs> scene. Um, but you, you know, you had other guys uh, like Ed Cannonball Crane. Uh, uh, Great nickname. Yeah, Cannonball. He was a troublemaker. Um, died, died tragically. He died at the broke at the age of thirty four. Um, he, he was a troublemaker for a lot of the young young players on the Kelly's Killers, and uh, they had to send uh, some of the younger players. Actually, um, sent some of the players to uh, Chris Vondere's St. Louis Browns to get some of the younger players away from uh, well, one get one one player in particular and his name is Willie Maines. He was in a lot of trouble. He was getting a lot of trouble down in Louisville cuz Louisville used to have a major league baseball team from 1882 to uh, 1899, one of the one of the Reds biggest rivals. But um, they were in the American Association at the time, so they were they played the Kelly's Killers and not the Red uh, not the Reds, but Willie Maine's father was coming down on a train to, to straighten this poor kid out and d- tragically died in a, in a train accident. You know, I can't imagine Willie Maine's carrying that around with him for the rest of his life. But Ed, Ed, Ed Crane was a really bad influence on him. And Mike Kelly decked him in the face once. And, and he came, came to came, – came, he was a starting pitcher the next day. He came, came to the game with a big black eye. And the, the, the two said nothing. However, I think uh, Crane got the win. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that, he should have done that all the time. But he led the association. Association in ERA, so he was a, he was a pretty good he was a pretty good pitcher. And I guess antics like that have carried on through baseball throughout <laughs> the modern era. I mean, just oh, you know, last decade, and Zimbrano was decking his catcher in the dugout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this, you know, some things never change. No, um, but you, uh, you, we were talking pitching. Uh, Frank Dwyer, Frank Dwyer was uh, one of their aces, and uh, Frank Dwyer actually went on to play for the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, after you know, if, if from 18, 1892 to eighteen ninety nine, it was mostly known as a Cincinnati Reds player. Dwyer was, yeah, wasn't he? absolutely, and and he um, he ranks eighth on the Reds all time wins list. Now, nine of the ten players in the top ten are in the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame in, in, in wins. D- Frank Dwyer isn't there yet. So he won 133 games. I think he's he's a, he's ahead of Joe Nuxall. Joe Nuxall may be at 131. I'm not sure. And I think he's right behind Jim Maloney by by one one win. But he's 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 he ranks eighth. 
and <clears throat> hopefully we'll see him enshrined. And I think it would be cool. I think it would be cool because of my connections with the Reds Hall of Fame. I think it would be cool to see a slight mention of his of of, of the fact that he played with the, with the, with another Cincinnati Major League Baseball team. You know, uh, the Kelly's Killers. It's hard to compare some statistics from the from the older era because of the, the, the some of the rules changes. I mean, it, it, it favored pitchers for a decade, then it yeah. favored hitters for a decade. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm sure he was influenced by some of that. But with 133, if you think about it, that's more than Johnny Cueto. It's more than yep. Bronson Arroyo. Yep. And those guys are they, they had won 10 games a year for 10 years. Well, you, you know what what happened with Dwyer is during a game he uh, he got hit in the head with really hard with a baseball. A baseball came and. And um, hit him square in the head and knocked him unconscious. And after that, he was never the same. So, had had that not happened, he would have gone on to win more games and would have gotten higher higher up there in the in the Reds wins. And I'm sure he would have. And and, and Dwyer, he stayed in baseball and and he, and he, and he would would, uh, would carry on a several different roles. But one, he did umpire for a while yeah. after his playing career, and it was notable. He was the guy who was behind the plate when Cy Young hurled a perfect game in May of 1904. I know. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Stan, I think that game was against the Philadelphia Athletics. But so Dwyer, you know, Dwyer has not just a legacy. He's, he's got a, a neat, neat legacy in Cincinnati, playing for the Kelly's Killers, one, one of the few players that have played for the Killers and the, the, the modern Reds. Um, there, there were there were a couple other players. I can't remember the guy's name. Well, actually, it might have been Ed Cannonball Crane to, to yeah, Ed Crane played for – started the 1891 season with the Killers, and then he went to the Reds. So he played, played, played on two Major League Baseball teams in Cincinnati in the same season. I think that's, that's, that's kind of amusing. <laughs> you know? It's very amusing. Just me, though. Yeah, it's, it's – uh, I, I would think – this is, this is another key thing about the Killers and their staff. Frank, uh, Frank Bancroft – who's known today as, as the father of, 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 of opening day, um, he was the business man- manager for the, 18, for, for the Kelly's Killer. So he, uh, he came to Cincinnati, or he came for the, to the Reds and worked for them from eight, 1892 to 1920. So, but he, he was the father of opening, opening day. His first opening day, um, you know, this bombastic festivities and whatnot, um, was with the Kelly's Killers, not with the Reds. You know? He's known for being a, a, a Reds legend. I mean, he's the business manager. I mean, there's yeah. several pictures, and you see his, his face and image still in the ballpark today. Banny. Well, he, well, yeah, Banny. Well, he, he, um, the Reds Hall of Fame used to have a, a huge plaque of Frank Bancroft, and um, and that plaque was 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 uh, was was, I, was up at Crosley Field for for many many years, and <laughs> I, I know some of my fellow uh, coworkers that. That that took that plaque off the wall. Know how mon- how big of a monstrosity that thing is to move. It is impossible to move that that plaque. So they saw, they thought very highly of him to put that plaque in there. But yeah, he's a father of opening day, and his, it all started when with, with the with the uh, you know with the Kelly's Killers. And when he became known as the father of opening day, of course, that was much later. You know, we right. referred back to him as um, he didn't call himself the father of opening day. But the first opening day parade was it the Kelly Killers in 1891? Well, um, they always they had opening day parades, um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't to the extent because he made it out to be like a yeah yeah to, where it later became a national a holiday in the city yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. because of how you know, how much that he had put into that and it made it such a big event yeah for for our, for our national listeners who aren't aren't familiar um, opening day in Cincinnati is a huge huge local holiday and. Um, we actually, Rufus and I walked in it this year. Yeah, we we play vintage baseball, and they asked our vintage baseball team to to, to walk in the parade. It was it was a, it was it was a great honor. I had never walked in a parade before, but it is a big big thing here in Cincinnati, and for and Frank Bancroft established it really you really took it up a notch. You know what I mean? And and it was it was the it was the Cincinnati Kelly's Killers um, team that he did it for, not the Cincinnati Reds. It's always interesting each year in, in the modern era, you listen to some of the new Reds players that are brand new to the Cincinnati team that haven't played here before. And it's that their yeah. reaction to opening days. Oh, wow. I cannot believe that this is such a celebrated day like, like, like it is. And then other players and uh, their, their fellow you know, teammates would tell them, oh, this is a big day in Cincinnati where it may not have been where you were in the past. Now, Farmer Vaughn, another player that played for the, he was a, he was he was a catcher. Mike Kelly played was was the main catcher, 
Mike Kelly played everywhere. <laughs> he pitched. He did. You know, he, he played in every position. Came up as a catcher, didn't he? Uh, I don't know. But you know, he he did can't came up. And what was the first team he played? What, what city did he play for first? Cincinnati. Right, and he was one of the very first um, catchers to wear all the gear. You know, well, as it was where, becoming introduced, he but he but he I, I yeah well, I, I wanted to slip that in there too before we forgot. Um, Mike Kelly did begin his major league career in Cincinnati with the second incarnation of the Reds in the 1878 and 79, and he made an instant impact because that 79 club nearly won the pennant. Right, and that's the whole reason he, he came back in the first. He, he came back right. because Cincinnati well, he had, had loved him as a player, and he came back as a player manager. He he wanted to come back, so he wanted to come back. Um, but but Farmer Vaughn Farmer Vaughn played a lot of catcher too. Um, I, I bring him up because he played nine seasons with the Cincinnati Reds as well. So him and him and Frank Devire, if you were German back then, <laughs> some of these guys. What, what, what did you say, Rufus? Some of these guys uh, had trouble pronouncing some of these names because they, you know they, they we, we were we were a German town here in Cincinnati. Right, absolutely. And Cincinnati has always traditionally had a hard time accepting players that had names that were difficult to pronounce. Right, and you you would think Dwyer would be easy. So his exclusion from the Reds Hall of Fame with the numbers that he's put up, I uh, could have come into something like that. So there's some German bias there. But him and Farmer Vaughn went on to be battery mates for the for the Cincinnati Reds, and I think that's really cool that two two um, two guys went on to to. to Played for the Reds, but but ultimately for this club, this this club's this club's ballpark was built on the east side of town. Okay, so you had the Reds on the east, you had the uh, or the Reds on the west side of town in League Park, and you had the Kelly's Killers at East East End Park on the east side of town. And it wasn't walking distance between the two parks. No, it was it was <laughs> it was a good twenty minute half hour steamboat ride. You know, or or you know, horse drawn carriage, or you could jump on a train, and it still took twenty minutes. Yeah, it, it was you know back then, you know, for 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 uh, Cincinnati listeners that are familiar with, with East East End is well, was a suburb at that time, you know, and you didn't just just hop in a car or a motor motorcycle and 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 get from one place to the next with ease. I mean, it was tough to to move around. And so the ballpark was too far out. But the neat thing about this ballpark was um, Coney Island opened a few years earlier. Okay, Coney Island, um, Cincinnati's Coney Island opened a few years earlier. You could catch a steamer from from Coney Island and and and, and go to uh, and, and take it take it down the river to Easton Park. Easton Park was a was one of the very, very few major league ballparks that was accessible by the river. It was a really picturesque. Place to put, but it was just it was just too far out of the way, um, and they had so many other issues too. You know, so let's talk about this their season a little bit when yeah. you and going into the issues that they had and, and why it, why it failed, why right. it didn't make it. Um, they started off they had, uh, their, their, their schedule was late in the start of the season because the yeah. ballpark wasn't finished yet. They, they were. And then they had all had the flu when they got home. Yeah, they, or, or the or the grip la grippo or whatever you want to call it. Um, it was, yeah, they were all sick. You know, with 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 uh, with the flu, and um, and after all that, now they're in the cellar. Yeah, they're already, yeah they're already in the cellar. They're the bottom of the standings when it when it when it comes to all this, and they're trying to yeah. become the new team and popular. Yeah, but it just got off to a bad start. And with the standings Red, wise, the Reds weren't very good either. So we had two crummy teams that year. Um, but, um, but the ballpark location itself, it played into oh, the team failure as well. Big time. It was difficult for people to get out there. Uh, they they also they also tried because the American Association real fast folks the American Association allowed Sunday baseball back then you couldn't play Sunday baseball okay or there there were there were blue laws in place that 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 limited restricted certain types of businesses on Sundays and so the Cincinnati police included baseball in that you know under under that umbrella you know and so. The National League didn't have Sunday games, so and when they did, the, the Reds were were arrested <laughs> and taken down to the local jail, and and they they were, would get in trouble. So they, they they didn't play they didn't play Sunday baseball that much. But the Kelly's Killers were very were, were notorious for for challenging the Blue Law and playing games on Sundays. And this is just this is just stuff of gold. You know what I mean? Yeah. These guys, you know. Going and trotting out there, the, the fans are unsure if they, who's going to get arrested. 
And sometimes they would allow the game to be finished and they would arrest them, or sometimes they would shut the game down after the second inning and, and arrest them. Like there was a, a <laughs> one incident that I had remember reading about uh, as far as when they were, were arrested. The, the uh, visiting team started and played the first, the top half of the first yeah, inning. Yeah, yeah. And when they came to bat to play in there, and that's when they got arrested. And the police that had come to do it, they had, they had brought a whole troop. Italian. And, they, and they're marching in military sharp movements and yes. really really making a, a a forceful, you know, intimidation factor out there back, while they're, they're trying to play. They were moving back and forth, back and forth, like like an army, a military. And, and the fans were just kind of, they didn't know what to think. Let's clear it up real quick. Though. <laughs> a blue law restriction. Yeah. What exactly is a blue law restriction? I mean, I know that they, they were designed to enforce religious standards. Right, right. And I mean, in all the, most states had blue law restrictions. Some states, a lot of states still have blue law restrictions today. Well, I, yeah. Um, like for instance, uh, the state of Illinois, you cannot sell cars on Sunday. Like you cannot sell an automobile. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of a lot of places have counties where they restrict alcohol sales. Right. Uh, sometimes they, you can't you can't have a retail business on Sundays. That's, that's a lot of them have been have been thrown out. You know you know right. coming into or, the modern or, era or ignored. But the blue law restrictions were um, um, kind of religious laws that they had they had followed and it, adhered to. Yeah, and and some some states uh, you know like St. Louis, um, Chris Vondere. Listen, folks, the Cardinals have always been – they were called the Browns back then, but the Cardinals have always drawn well, and they would just crush it on Sundays. You know what I mean? And Von Der A saw that, and he felt that he, 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 pushed, the, he pushed the subject in, in Cincinnati. But St. Louis and Louisville, those, those two cities didn't restrict – Restrict baseball, and the 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 the, the, the Kelly's Killers actually looked for sp- spots in northern Kentucky along the, the Licking River. I think, I think, don't quote me on this, but around a, a spot where there could be a potential MLS soccer team pl- place. There, there, you know, there's some talk about an MLS team coming to Cincinnati, and, and it's pretty much the south side of Cincinnati is the greatest yeah. Cincinnati area. It, it's and they were looking to put a ballpark, uh, uh, have find a ballpark there where they could where they could get around the Blue Law and play play their Sunday games in, in, in Kentucky, and then go back and play the regular games during the week. But it, it, it never panned out. But um, but that uh, Chris Vondere, I'm sure he wasn't a very um, uh, he didn't I'm sure he didn't like the blue law restrictions too much. Oh God, no! He liked to sit in the ballpark in the stands, and he'd sit there um, in, in the seats, you yeah. know, as a spectator with a whistle, yeah, and uh, a pair of binoculars. Yeah. The binoculars obviously to see. <laughs> well, what was his whistle for? Oh, he wanted some brewski. <laughs> Anytime that glass needed to refill, he'd blow that whistle. That would have been me. That would have been me. Top me off. Somebody top me off. <laughs> But um, man, yeah, he, he was a he, that guy was a colorful character, and we're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna eventually do a um, a show on the on the St. Louis Browns, and um, I have a friend who wrote a, book, a great book about about it, and we'll ha- see if we can have him as a guest star. But Chris Vondere was a great colorful character, and he really belongs in the in the Baseball Hall of Fame for his contributions uh, to, to the game. Um, but you know, it, it, it's it just the, the attendance. It was just difficult getting people there. Uh, the it, it just didn't work out. It's unfortunate. Um, it would have been cool to have that have. Well, well, but this is actually what happened. What they had planned. The the, the, the team disbanded uh, a third of the way, th- uh, three fourths of the way through the season, and a, a club from the Western League called the Milwaukee Brewers finished their schedule out. A lot of people think that the Kelly's Killers moved to Milwaukee. They didn't. Uh, the the association said, no, we want you to have a franchise. We're going to keep a franchise for Cincinnati, and we'll relaunch it in 1892. Um, Milwaukee will just come in and fill out, finish out your schedule. That's what they'll do. Um, and some of the Kelly's Killers went, went to play for Milwaukee, and Frank Bancroft actually went up there to assist in the business, in, 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 you know, in the business end of things. But um, and even though the Milwaukee team finished the schedule, they didn't finish it in Cincinnati. They played no. their home games yeah. in Wisconsin. Exactly. They, they they wanted they wanted a team, and they, they felt that, that this was a good shot to prove that that they they, they had the opportunity. It was an opportunity for them. But what was what, what the what the Reds ownership were, were doing? The uh, franchise was going to return in 1892. And they were going to put a park on the west side of town, okay, the west side. So they would have been on the same side of the of town where the Reds were. I don't know if their ballpark. Uh, they they they've scouted a few locations, but the, the two locations I don't think were near um, League Park, you know. But um, they they had a full intent on on, on relaunching uh, and and moving moving to the moving to the uh, you know 
opposite side of town. The place they played in over in, um, in, in what they call the East End Park. Right. Uh, it, it, from what I understand, there's still baseball there today? Absolutely, and that's what's really cool. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go down there. I think it'd be cool to put a vintage baseball team. since Not Kelly Major Field. League Baseball, but there's no, still baseball right. fields, and it's been played continuously yes. since that time. Yeah, you, you had I, – I think uh, – uh, this is this is a hearsay or whatever, but I've talked to people who claim that there were Negro League teams that would play there in the 1920s and, and whatnot, and uh, you know, like tons of amateur clubs. My grandmother, who was raised in the East End, said she used to go down there all the time. And the baseball field was there. They added a pool in the out, outfield, but um, yeah, it, the Major League Baseball ceased there. However, however, Rufus, um, the Reds nearly played there. They really? nearly played there when they're. Yeah, they do. Do, 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 do. Which was not in nineteen oh one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, their their grandstand burned down, and, and then they had to have some some place to play, and there was an existing ballpark over in the East End. And Frank Bancroft, I guess, suspect this is speculation, folks, that he probably was a guy who said, "Hey, why don't we move move over to East End Park?" Because they did they did go over there uh, over there um, frequently and and for, for for odds and ends and stuff like that. But the Reds nearly played at that ballpark and, and uh, until the until their new uh, ballpark, which became later known as Palace of the Fans, uh, was was constructed. So they you know the the ballpark nearly had the Reds play there too, and I, that would have been even extra cool because that I, that spot, spot needs needs a marker as well. It doesn't have a marker. Um, and, and, and there's still history being made there today. Like we said, there's still baseball being played there. It's um, um, yeah. It's not you know professional leagues, but it's um, the two baseball fields that currently right. sitting at. One's called C. L. Harrison Field. The yeah. other one's called Paul Kramer Field. May have been named after baseball players or associates. I'm not too. I'm not sure where those names came from. Right. But it's um. But the field was it, it was compiled right in the middle of where all that is, and it's still to this day you can, you can see how how the outline of, of of that diamond that ballpark was laid out and overlooking into the river as well. And when you, there's it's a, a beautiful spot, and there's a line of trees. These giant trees, a line of trees that go down that would have gone down the right right side of the ballpark. And you wouldn't have smelled the creek, and you wouldn't have smelled the slaughterhouses, and you wouldn't have heard no. the railroad. It yeah. was a it was a picturesque, uh, very uh, um, a pastoral setting for baseball. Yeah, there is there is a couple images of it. Um, if you go to Wikipedia, I actually wrote most of the information on the Wikipedia um, article. I, I I took a picture of what's there now, and I took a, and I. In the same spot where the where the the only one of the few known pictures of Easton Park is, I have both of them listed there. So you listeners go out there and and, and maybe look it up. And then when you do look that up, it's very interesting because what he did there, he laid two photographs on top of each other, and the top one being clear, so you could see through under underneath of it, you know how how it was situated. Ultimately, the franchise uh, came to its uh, conclusion when the National League and the American Association merged. So when that happened. The, 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 the National League was not going to have two teams. No. And, and they had even made a law. Didn't they, they had made a restriction, too, saying that there couldn't be another club within so many miles of, of, of that club in the National League? I, 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 I am guessing. It was like a five-mile like five mile radius or whatever. Right. And, and, and when they did that, that put out some of the clubs that were trying to compete to become professional leagues in northern Kentucky. Yeah, down the line. Yeah. I mean, it, it shot out Covington. It shot off uh, Ludlow. And so that's... That is the uh, ultimate story of my beloved Cincinnati Kelly's Killers. The, uh, folks, it, it, it's, it's a real, the club's a real soft spot for me. Um, and uh, I, I love talking about the Kelly's Killers. A lot of people don't know about them. They're just, they're just a neat club. And if I could go back in time, I would love to, to, to just be around those guys. I mean, Cannonball, Crane, and King <laughs> Kelly, and Farmer Vaughn, and Banny doing their things back in the <clears throat> early times. It's uh, uh, still when baseball was, was pretty primitive. Well, you know, people ask me, Jim, if you could go back and, and see any game in Major League Baseball history, I always say opening day uh, for the, with the Cincinnati Kelly's Killers. I would have lo- loved to have gone to and sat in that in that grand, grandstand in East End uh, Park and, and watched the Kelly's Killers. Now, now I'm a Reds fan. Um, if I could go back and watch any Reds game, it would be with the Game 7 of the 1940 World Series, the only one that was won in Cincinnati against Detroit. Uh, Rufus, I don't know if you still have your loyalties from your Detroit days. <laughs> um, I didn't mention much in my bio in the last episode. I was born in northern Ohio, near Cleveland, and as a small boy, we moved to Detroit. And when we moved to Detroit, it was in the early 80s. And I, my first team that I fell in love with was the Tigers. I mean, it was a great team. Lance Parrish and Kurt Gibson. And um, it was, a, I mean, that was that was Jack Morris. That was our team. And uh, we moved here in the mid-80s. And I was 
astounded when I went to the Reds ballpark and learned that a guy named Sparky Anderson was the manager of the Reds. That's, that's my <laughs> Tigers guy. But uh, in those young years, that's when I started playing baseball as a youth myself. And then naturally, I was I was associated with players like Eric Davis and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Those guys became my favorites. So soon I became a Reds fan and then a general baseball fan overall. Right. But uh, no, I mean, I had them, them Detroit uh, connections, but uh, that was more than once as uh, Detroit and Cincinnati faced off. Hey, your precious Detroit Wolverines <laughs> that wouldn't leave the National Association in 1885, um, you know, disallowed uh, the Cincinnati Outlaw Reds to move into the National League. Now, think about this. Had the, had the Outlaw Reds been, or, or unions been good, in the National League, the and when the association merged, it's very possible that this current franchise would have wilted on the vine, and the and the Outlaw Reds would have become the team the the the, the, the team that 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 endured um, had the, the Detroit Wolverines not um, regrouped and disallowed us a spot. So you know, it, it's fun to think about stuff like that. It is, and we like to talk about some of the colorful history and some of these stories that came from it, but. It was a bit of a different game at that time. Oh, I mean, God. 1891, I mean, they weren't pitching at 60 feet, 6 inches by then. That, I think that it was, was almost, yeah. but not quite. But the, you, the modern game was more and more in place by that, that time. That's it for our podcast uh, today. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Jim Farmer. And I'm Rufus Guy. And you have been listening to the Old Time Baseball Show. We'd like to thank our producer, Cam Miller. And uh, we would like to thank Jim Mattingly for designing our logo. And, of course, we, would, we want to thank Mike Goodpasture for having us on his uh, the, the Grueling Truth uh, so that everybody out there can listen to this. Thank you, and keep yourselves alive.